Thank you so much. And th thank you also to Hanif for the invitation to speak again on this extremely important topic. Um, it's a pleasure to be part of this panel. Uh, so crimes against humanity are crimes that are committed as part of a widespread or systematic attack on a civilian population. The detention, disappearance, torture and killings of large numbers of Iranian civilians in 1988 and today qualify as both widespread and systematic attack on a civilian population. These crimes committed against Iranians in 1988 and today amount to the crimes of humanity, of murder, torture, imprisonment or severe deprivation of liberty, persecution on political and religious grounds, enforced disappearances and other inhumane acts. The impunity surrounding these crimes has only emboldened the perpetrators. With Ibrahim Raisi in power, it is clear that within Iran, there will not be justice for victims and that the violence only continues. I want to propose some solutions using international law and foreign domestic law mechanisms. Now, I'm always asked about the role of the International Criminal Court, so I want to talk about that first uh, and, and get that one out of the way. The ICC is not an option for accountability for the 1988 massacres because the ICC only has jurisdiction over crimes committed since July 2002. With regards to the current crimes, the answer is unfortunately also not hopeful. Unsurprisingly, Iran is not a party to the International Criminal Court. Therefore, the ICC would have no territorial jurisdiction under which it can prosecute international crimes committed in the territory of a state party. The only option would be for the UN Security Council to refer the situation in Iran to the ICC as it did for the situation in Darfur, Sudan. However, this is unlikely to happen or to pass as it, uh, because Russia as an ally of Iran and a permanent five member of the Security Council would likely exercise its veto power over any proposed resolution to refer Iran to the ICC. Hence, the ICC is not a probable option, so I want to have a look at other possible accountability mechanisms. I want to now take this, the situation of Syria as an equivalent situation with a government that has and continues to commit serious human rights abuses against its population, including the extensive use of torture against civilians, like the government in Iran. In 2014, there was an attempt to refer the situation in Syria to the International Criminal Court, but this was vetoed by Russia. However, there are other court options. In June this year, the Netherlands and Canada initiated proceedings in the International Court of Justice against Syria, <laughs> alleging that Syria has international responsibility for its gross and systematic failure to fulfill its obligations under the Convention Against Torture, to prohibit torture and other forms of cruel, inhuman, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. Syria has thus far not participated in proceedings, but Canada and the Netherlands have requested provisional measures of arbitra uh, including the cessation and prevention of all acts of torture, cessation of arbitrary detention, and release of all persons arbitrarily detained, allowing monitoring of places of detention, and disclosing the location of burial sites of persons killed through torture. And the court is now deliberating this request. Now, Iran is not, again, unsurprisingly, not a party to the Convention Against Torture, but it is an active member of the International Court of Justice. And the prohibition on torture and cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment is customary international law. And therefore, this would be a means for any state to bring a case against Iran in the ICJ. Such proceedings could use the same arguments as the case against Syria with similar requests for provisional measures. Likewise, though, the right to life is customary law and an argument could also be made that the prohibition on enforced disappearances is customary law, which means allegations of the violations of these rights under customary law could also be to initiate proceedings. I also want to touch on universal jurisdiction, which has been mentioned by the Special Rapporteur and the Ambassador. So returning to Syria, third states have also been involved in the prosecution of perpetrators of torture. In recent years, Germany convicted a former senior Syrian intelligence officer for crimes against humanity and a lower ranking officer for aiding and abetting crimes against humanity. Both of these convictions related to torture, deprivation of liberty and rape committed in Syria from 2011 to 2012. The crimes and crime category are thus the same as those we find in Iran. 
The case is a precedent of the enactment of universal jurisdiction in a foreign domestic court. Universal jurisdiction allows a country to prosecute a national of any country for international crimes committed anywhere in the world. And we've already seen, as has been mentioned, a precedent for using universal jurisdiction with regards to crimes committed in Iran. The July 2022 conviction of Sweden, in Sweden of Hamid Nouri is a key example of the use of universal jurisdiction to, against perpetrators of the 1988 killings. Nouri traveled to Sweden where he was arrested, tried and convicted for his role in the 1988 executions. Sweden's example, just like Germany's example with the Syrians, should be followed by other countries. A dedication to prosecuting Iranian human rights violators would effectively render a travel ban on those who participated in the 1988 executions and those who are perpetrating current crimes as they would be arrested if they traveled abroad. This would also complement any current sanctions regimes against Iranian individuals, which I also want to mention. The UN Security Council previously passed sanctions against Iran in relation to Iran's refusal to suspend its Iranian enrichment program. However, there have been no UN sanctions imposed with regards to human rights violations, undoubtedly, of course, again, due to Russia. Individual state sanctions for human rights violations are also not comprehensive. For example, the United States and Australia have sanctions against Iran related to the non-proliferation, but not human rights violations. On a positive note, the European Council, on the other hand, has a range of measures responding to serious human rights violations, including freezing assets and a travel ban, and also, interestingly, ban on exports to Iran of equipment that might be used for internal repression and for monitoring telecommunications. These restrictive measures have escalated significantly since the death of Masa Amini and now apply throughout the EU to a total of 227 Iranian individuals and 43 entities. I advocate that other states should follow the EC and use their domestic sanctions capacity to impose restrictions on Iranian individuals responsible for human rights violations. Again, states like the US and Australia both have Magnitsky laws enabling sanctions to be passed for human rights violations without the need for a UN resolution, and they should be using them. These are only some options for accountability, but I call on leaders at all national and international levels to implement these to ensure justice for victims of human rights abuses in Iran. Thank you.